Good evening. We'd like to welcome you to the September 19th regular meeting of the Nicholas County Board of Education. At this time, we'd ask that uh, you'd stand and join us for a moment of silent reflection. Discussion the construction update with ZMM. So, if you gentlemen would like to take over for a few minutes, just hit this, Chris. So, is Rick able to see this? Mr. Green, can you see this presentation? Sure can. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, a few updates since we were here last. Um, we're going to go ahead and give the design update and the construction update uh, for the projects and along with some progress photos. Let me do something real quick so you can see it better. Okay. So design update uh, for the Cherry River Richwood School. Uh, this evening, one of the, the items is an action item uh, for approval of the construction documents to be submitted to the School Building Authority. And then contingent upon the School Building Authority's approval uh, to advertise the project for bid. Uh, based on this schedule, currently presenting this this evening, bids would be received in November of this year and construction would commence around the end of this year, calendar year. Uh, construction, again, would be dictated by the contractor, but we're looking at approximately uh, March of 2025. So on the Nicholas County High School, Summersville Middle School, uh, the Glade Creek site, uh, we are still revising the, de the design development documents and working through the design development submission. Uh, we anticipate that we're gonna bring that to the board in December of uh, this year and then construction documents are scheduled to be submitted to the board for final approval in february of this year uh, based on this schedule again this stays pretty much the same bids would be received late april early may just depends on how fast the approval process goes uh, and then construction would commence in may of 2023 and you're looking at a completion date of approximately august of 25. Uh, on the construction administration side, on the Glade Creek, Nicholas County High School, Summersville Middle School, uh, the current mass grading package, uh, we reported before we had uh, requested a cost proposal from m &H Construction for the site revisions. Again, that is to surcharge the pad since the pad is going to be uh, vacated for a period of time and allow water to drain off the pad and not sit in the winter. Um, the other part of this is that it reflects the uh, the updated footprint. Uh, so there's a couple of revisions in stormwater that's going to happen with that. Uh, m &H has submitted just as of the end of last week a preliminary cost proposal. It's still being reviewed. We've already gotten back to them with some additional information that is required. Uh, and then on. Uh, one other thing on the construction administration side, uh, the change order one, uh, which is for the expansion of the limits of disturbance that was originally priced as an alternate bid. Uh, that basically expanded the limits of disturbance 
on the west end of the, or the east side of the property where the baseball and softball fields are. Uh, that expansion was going to allow us to reduce the overall retaining wall heights in that area. Uh, we have got all of the information finally with a lot of back and forth with the uh, M&H. We have a price that's being the final review, but we anticipate that change order will be issued. And right now I can report, I don't have the exact number, but it is a credit of around $235,000. Uh, site utilities, uh, we talked about this being an additional package. Um, we recommended to do a site utility package and an erosion sediment control maintenance package that would keep the contractor on site after m &H has completed their work and be there while the, the building construction starts. Um, we're, actually in, we're actually going to introduce the asphalt paving, the base course paving into this package as well. Uh, it does several things for us. It will actually give contractor a nice solid base to work off of on the, on the parking lots and the drive lanes. Uh, it will also give them a nice lay down area. It will also decrease rutting and tearing up of the gravel lots, uh, which that will require some replacement. Uh, it will also reduce some of the overall costs we feel uh, by moving it into this package. So uh, we anticipate bids we receive in this package November or December of this year. Um, the reason that it's still variable is we do have to go through an approval process with this, uh, but at the same time, uh, we are relying on utility information, which is not sometimes the fastest to get. Chris, when you say an approval process, who does that go through? It would be just like this. If we would bring it to you all for approval, the SBA does have to approve it. Uh, but we have talked to them about this package and don't expect this to take very long on an approval process with them at all. Um, we do, but we do have to run a few things by the utility companies. And we have been in communication back and forth with, with them on this package. Uh, construction update on uh, the, the same site. Uh, they're continuing to place fill, fill in, on the round site. They're working on their diversion ditches and their other erosion and sediment control measures. Uh, they're still placing the manhole vertical extensions on the 48-inch concrete pipe and working to fill that subgrade. They've got a lot of that filled in here recently. Uh, retaining wall one, that's the one, the wall that goes along the, on the west side of the property, uh, closest to the football mm -hmm. stadium. Uh, that wall is now complete. Uh, the construction of wall two is now underway. That is the wall that's closest, we'll say, closest to um, Frito Lay there on that, that section of the site. Uh, then they are lining the uh, retaining wall retention ponds uh, and still removing a few unsuitable soils. They did hit coal, which we anticipated they would. Uh, they have removed most of that that they've encountered at this point. Um, progress photos from what you've seen probably haven't changed a whole lot. It's been really, really wet and rainy since the last report. Uh, they have had some weather here over the last couple weeks to work and make a lot of progress. Um, so this is the view from the cemetery ridge looking out. Freedom Lake will be out here on your left. Um, still doing final fill material stockpile uh, on, along the middle ridge of the site. Uh, you can see these are some of the, the storm 48-inch uh, ex extensions that we're talking about on this manhole on that concrete pipe section. To give you a reference, here's the road coming in that leads out to 41. Uh, and then this is looking towards the west side of the property. This is the top of retaining wall one. It is completely installed. And this is retaining wall number two. It is now uh, underway. Chris, um, what, what is the purpose of that wall? Because that ground there is higher than... When it's built up, this wall is not real, real tall, but when it's built, built up, this is actually going to pick up the, the adjacent wall, the the uh, grade surface. It there. doesn't connect the other, to the other wall. No, it doesn't. It's a freestanding wall. It, what it does is it keeps the grade along the corner of the property at the Frito Lake prop, the corner mm -hmm. of the property, that area there. It's going to allow that property to maintain and we can drop the grade there and adjust it. Yeah. So, so the grade rolls into that? Yes. 
And I know the, the retaining pond is right below that. To the yeah, left you, you've got the pond. Actually, you can see part of it here. You can mm -hmm. see a little bit of that dished out. That's where the, the retaining pond is on that end of the property. This one's not a huge wall. This one's pretty low compared to the others. So they put a lot of gravel behind that wall? Yes. yes. So, so this goes in, and then you get a complete gravel backfill. Uh, it's like almost three feet deep in sections of it. It allows it to drain through. Probably through, yeah. Yep. And then it'll get, it'll get drainage pipe that can, continues on through this as well. Yeah, this is one of the retaining wall, the retain, retention ponds. Uh, they're still lining some of that with some of the, the site clays. Uh, this is some of the coal that they did remove. It's low grade. It's referred to as dirty coal. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Not really a whole lot they can do with it, but it is to be removed and trucked off site. Uh, so they're collecting as much of it so they can do one kind of mass exodus with that uh, material. And that's it. Any questions on the construction? Chris, are, are you able to send that to us? I, I'm having trouble seeing this. Are you able to send it to us? Sure, I'll put it in your team's folder. I'm sorry. I'll put it in your files for today's meeting. Oh, okay. Thank you. Any questions? And, and of course, we don't know when the bid will go out for the Richwood project, but we have to wait for the review. SBA has to. Yeah, so. Um, so if the, the board takes action to approve that to go to the school building authority, um, everything is ready. We have to print the documents tomorrow, but everything else, the submission documents that go with them are already prepared and ready to go. Um, barring any unforeseen things that we just don't expect, uh, we would say you'd probably be in a position to advertise probably the second week of October. It would be a realistic time frame by the time we get comments back. Um, that would put a pre-bid conference near the end of October, first part of November, with bids received before Thanksgiving. That would be the anticipation. And I think if the SBA moves that up, I mean, if they don't have any comments or if they just want to push it on through, mm -hmm. all that gets, gets sped up. Yeah, it would get sped up. Ideally, we would like to get it advertised and bids received before the Thanksgiving week. They, they don't, don't, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, you don't think they'll, where they've changed uh, leadership, you don't think that'll hold us up any no. longer? No, they, they have to be, they have a, they typically have a timeline of two weeks. That's the maximum. And we like to, depends on if that person that reviews that is in the office when we submit, are they out doing visits to counties or how often they get it. Typically, you know, we've been told on these projects they're going to push it through as fast as they can. So they, they probably won't have a lot of comments. They've seen the front end before, the, the bid part of the spec before. So I feel very comfortable they're going to go quicker than usual. Uh, and they shouldn't have too many, if any, comments at all. Because this is the second, this is the rebid. And so this is should, just down to 6200 standards. Yeah, just yeah. down to 6200 standards. And that's, that's what they stressed, and that's what we achieved. So hopefully they'll be able to return that back as quick as they can. Now will they look at those options as well? We had a couple. Yes, so uh, just to let you know, since uh, over the last few weeks, we have talked to Dana Womack with the School Building Authority and Mark Miller, mm -hmm. made them aware of the plan changes, which they both have been made aware of. Uh, and then I reached out to Mark Miller this morning, reminding him that he should have the submission in his hands this week. So. And then we the, told him the goal is to get it bid by Thanksgiving. And to do that, we would need, a, we'd need him to turn it around in the, the appropriate time frame. So he uh, assured me that he was looking for the documents and he would be ready to go. Who is the acting inter interim director at the SBA? I don't think they have one. Uh, I don't think. Yeah, well, Dan, 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 Dan is in charge. Yeah. He, knows, he knows everything that, that, that we know because he's been in the last several meetings. Prior to that, and Dana, Dana was your county representative. Mm -hmm. Now he's director of architectural services. Mark Miller was the FEMA kind of the FEMA representative, but now he is uh, now he's your county representative. So, so they they've both been involved. They've been involved with it yeah. for a while. 
Yep. Not as many, not as long as Ben Ashley or David Rose, but they've been involved. Yep. And we've kept them updated quite a bit. And we've always invited them to our design meetings and in the office, so they've they've been there a lot. Regarding the previous bid that the superintendent recommended reject, uh, can we resubmit that bid and uh, along with this? Uh, and then compare the two to see which one we prefer. In case they are close together, can we ask for two bids? The one on the previous one that was supposed to be rebid and was not, and this new? Um, I don't think we can. Why I think I, you it's already ready. The SBA approved it. All the plans are. If, to, you mean to rebid that original project? Yeah. Or take the bid that you received? Rebid. Rebid it. So you want to rebid both projects? I want to rebid the original. We can't rebid this one because it hasn't been bid. I, I think what he's saying is if we rebid the first one, put it back out along with this one so, so that we can compare. So you're bidding both projects? Right. Uh, I don't know if FEMA or the SBA would allow us to do that. I'd have to ask. Well, I was going to say is one of the things that we were um, charged with doing was reducing it to policy 6200 standards. So if you go back and you rebid what the board rejected previously because the price was so high, then you're not bidding it at 6200 standards. You're bidding it at a much higher standard than what the Glade Creek is going to be bid at. So the goal was to bid both facilities at the 6200 standard mark. If you're doing the other, you're not, you're not going along with. It, it, if we did that, we would have to take the front end of the original project and make it like this front end, so you're bidding apples to apples. Because the original building, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, yeah. the original building the schedule was built into that contract. This schedule is up to whoever's bidding the contract. Whoever con whatever contractor bids, he's he's set his own schedule. The previous the previous the previous bid was set around phasing and we dictated the phases. So we would have to change that a little bit and might put you out a little bit longer. And I don't know the contractor is going to pick and choose which job which job they bid. They're, Every contractor is not going to bid both because they'll have tens of thousands of dollars in time bidding a job. So contractor A, B, and C might choose which project they bid. So you might not get as many bidders on both projects as you would think. Well, and if it's going to take more time, we don't have that. No, you don't have the time because we would, it would take us a few weeks to reorganize that bid set. And then I don't think the contractor my gut's telling me the contractors would not, they would pick which project would be the least expensive and bid that one. I think, Mr. Well, Bush, you're how probably is, just... How is it any different than, than say, bid on this and then also uh, give us a bid on flex classes or what, uh, what if we want flex classes or what if we want something <coughs> else added on later? What's the difference? I, I, I think the psychology of that would be that as you were saying there, whoever's going to bid on it's going to say, I've got to go for the project that I think is going to be the lowest priced bid, and they're going to go with that one, and you know, they're all probably going to figure that out after looking it over and go with the one that's going to be right, the because when price. a contractor bids, you're in the low bidder award market. You're a public entity, it's public funds. Whoever the low bidder is, I don't care if you like the contractor or not, that's the guy. And that's the guy we have to work with. So if we're bidding a project that is more square footage, at the same time we're bidding a project that's less square footage, about what, 20,000 square feet uh, or less? It's, it's, not, it's closer to 10. 10,000 square feet less, then are you going to accept the one that's, and even if they came in at the same cost per square foot, the one that has more square footage is going to be more than the other one. So, I, I think what Mr. Moose is wanting to see is, and then I might be wrong, but I think you're wanting to see if if we put that bid back out, the original bid back out, how much it would come down from the first bid. Is that what you're right? 
the, right. and how it would compare to this. The, to answer your question about what the difference is with the flex classrooms and the gymnasium, um, that that's an alternate item to that bid. Um, the time invested to bid the two alternate classrooms and the gymnasium for a contractor maybe take them three to four additional days. To bid one set of documents versus the other set of documents, you could be looking at uh, three to four additional weeks. It's just, you they can't take all the information in one and apply it to the other. Some, yes, but there's enough changes in those documents that that's pretty significant. Unlike uh, adding this classroom to the end of the building, it's like you have to go back and actually compare what this one has and this one has if you're trying to reuse this number and plug it into here. Um, it's a very complicated process from a bidding perspective. Was the alternate projects included in the uh, new drawings? Yes. I thought there was so, so there's two, there's two alternates. There's an alternate to expand the gymnasium, yeah. make, it, make it deeper so that we have additional seating. Yeah. And then there's an alternate to add two flex classrooms to the north side. Of the That's what I understood. So my question is, let's say your um, the plans that we're looking at now. If we agreed to the phases, the ex the uh, other two phases, what would be the square footage between all of that and the original plan? So. So the base bid on the current bid package is just under 100,000 square feet. It's 99,000, I can't remember the exact number. 835. Okay. So that is the base bid without the two alternates. The classroom alternate adds around 2,000 square feet, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and I do not remember off the top of my head what the gymnasium is adding. Uh, we're talking a total, the, the total for the alternates was right at around 103,000 square feet. So you're about a 4,000 square foot increase. Uh, the difference between that package and what we originally bid, the original bid was around 108,000 square feet. So you're still looking at around 4,000 plus square feet. Uh, four to 5,000 square foot difference to answer your question. Okay. That's, that's going strictly off memory right. and round numbers, but yes. Close. Yes. But it, it, there's actually more to that than just square footage. We revised the dining area, we revised classroom locations. Right. Yeah. So right. there's quite a bit of change in the building footprint. Right. And I just wondered place, overall, overall square footage. Yeah. yeah. So, so about four to 5,000 square feet, if you were to look at all the alternates in one um, versus what we did previously. Right, and plus, you took out some of the fancies. So the, the dining room was the, the largest significant change. Uh, you've got, even though the square footage changed in size, we did change some finishes, we did change some lighting, we did change some um, restructuring of the addition. Uh, so the constructability is a little bit cheaper on a couple of items when we are able to reduce some of that square footage. So it's not a complete apples to apples. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Green's wanted to come home. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> well, if this bid comes back at a higher amount than the original bid that we rejected, we still can go back and rebid that project and accept it instead of this revised. I think if you if you rebid if if the if the smaller project, less square footage project that we're getting ready to put out for bid comes in higher than the original project, it stands to reason that the other project will be even higher because it's bigger in square footage and more complicated than than this one. Yeah. Well there's a bigger profit margin in and the original, there not, would be a bigger profit margin too. Not, not for the dollars that we're talking about and, and for the, the, the change in square footage there, the, the profit margin is probably not significant enough to make that big of a difference. The other concern that I would have 
is that the time, as you mentioned, we don't really want to take a lot of time. Uh, the timing of it would have to be submitted back to FEMA because this would be a change in the milestones and this would have to be revisited, which FEMA has advised the, against. That, that's what I was going to mention. We have to be mindful of the, of the milestones. Right. We have to because if we make unnecessary delays, or, we can't defend the FEMA. We're in je we can jeopardize losing the money. We, we still have two other projects to bid after <coughs> this one. And based upon where the, the last bids came in, I, I feel better with obviously the square footage reduction uh, to get the price down further. However, we still have a budget shortfall with the other two projects that we just need to be constantly mindful of as we move forward here. The costs are trending down a little bit, but no guarantees. Yeah. Because there's too many variables. There's location, there's availability contractors, there's yeah. all kinds of things that play into that. And just because we get one price on, on we'll say, the, the Richwood Cherry River School, that's not the dollars per square foot to apply to the school right. in Summersville. I mean, they're, they're an apple and an orange. They're completely different. So, I mean, I, I think the board's decision to reduce square footage in size and move forward is, is a, a very good decision to make because by reducing square footage, we, we feel that the costs are going to be less. So the alternate projects are not, won't be part of the bid. Yes. They oh, they will be. Yeah, they, they, okay. the contractor is going to give you a base bid price for that 99,000 square foot building. Okay. And then you get an additive price to add the, the gymnasium, the larger gymnasium, and you get an additive price to add the, okay. uh, the classrooms. Uh, and you can take zero, you can take one, or you can take both, but you have to take them in order. Well, this puts you in a bad position because if we, if that bid comes in high and we okay it, then you're going to have to go back to Glade and make more cuts mm -hmm. to stay within budget. Mm -hmm. So that's going to delay it even further. Well, I don't know how many cuts you can make because we still have to follow those policy guidelines and we still have a mediated agreement. We still have an approved CEFP plan. So if there's a shortfall of money, we have to figure out how to do it. You can't just completely take away from Glade Creek and say we're going to reduce it more when it's already at its minimum. But we have a scope document from FEMA that we submit. Yes. We have to meet the scope document. And if we say X amount of programs, we have to build X amount of programs. We just have to figure out how well, to do it. Well, we haven't seen Glade yet, so we don't know if it's at a minimum, do we? We did. Not we saw, We presented Glade and, and Cherry River schematics at the same time with the same proposed reductions. <coughs> yeah, so, and they it has been just the cursory. They weren't. And they had details. options as well. Yes. Yes, they have two options. There's two alternates for that one as well. Uh, a larger auditorium is one, and there was a running track as a second. Yes. Both schools are being designed according to policy 6200 based on the enrollment anticipated in both of those schools. Correct. Now, was the seating <coughs> at Glade enough for the size of the population? Seating in, in, in the, uh, in the, the gymnasium. Uh, uh, yes. yes. Did we talk? So, the yeah. so the, the, the seating at, so let me go back and visit the seating numbers here in my head. Uh, so the seating numbers at Glade, uh, we are allowed to seat the largest class. Mm -hmm. um, trying to go back and so see, it's, it's the largest class and then I'd have to all those numbers. I was thinking we had that on there as an alternate. No, we didn't, do the, we didn't do the gymnasium at all. No, the, 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 the auditorium. We did the auditorium because okay. even with the additive to the auditorium to get it to that mm -hmm. quantity, the percentage of student body that fits in there is still higher at Richwood than it is at Glade, but they're, they're a little bit more aligned by doing the, the balcony. Uh, because if the, 
the minimum you can build an auditorium for for a high school is 250. Mm. And that's what's at, at, at Richwood Cherry River. That seating for 250 is a higher percentage of the, the high school student body than building what we're allowed to build, which is one third of the student body at Blake Creek. If that makes sense? The percentage is you're seating a greater percentage in Richwood than you are. Mm -hmm. and, and the one request we had was to balance that out. So to balance it out it is an alternate to add a, a, a balcony and it gets the percentages closer in alignment, mm -hmm. but not quite, which was still a little bit earlier <coughs> on that end. What, what is it? There's some e thing, a game or something. E -gaming. E -gaming. What is that? E gaming? Uh -huh. e sports? E sports arena? That's being combined into the auditorium at Glade. What is it? It's a program, but it's, a, it's an educational program that you're providing e-sports, e e-gaming uh, credentials, I guess, after you graduate. It's, <coughs> so it's part of the it's CT part of the curriculum? Yeah, it's part of CT. It, it, was, it was originally its own space, and it was deleted to save square footage and incorporated into the auditorium. So we could do an overall reduction mm -hmm. of square footage. It was originally. It's um. It was originally the top part, right? Uh, you could see it from the top. You could see it. From it had its own. It was its own space. But we'll we'll see more on Glade, more detail, at a later date. Is that correct? Right. We submitted schematic design, and you approved schematic design. Now we're working on design development documents, which are due in December. December, I think. Um, and that's when you'll see a whole lot more detail of design development. So it's submitted to see these dudes in the submitted to Nicholas County, December fifth. Yep. That's when we'll be here doing this or that. <coughs> we have drawings there that we did a week before to look at the at the design of the design. And we, and we can do at that stage we can um, for that update, we can put it on the screen here mm -hmm. and kind of walk you through the floor plan. It has not changed a whole lot since we presented it at schematic because it's in its current state. Uh, that's what was approved. That's what we're working through. Um, that's the whole design that we're working to, to finalize is the, the, the schematic design you saw last. That's what we're working with. you have any approximate percentage that things are going up now? Do you have any idea of approximately the percentage that has in, that things have increased? Cost-wise? Yes. Yeah. Right, coming down. Things are starting to trend down a little bit. I, uh, I can, uh, the third-party cost analyst, analyst that we've used that works with the school building authority said, sent us something the other day where the the cost analysis of neighboring states like uh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, cost trends are starting to dip a little bit, but there's no guarantee that it's not going to pop back up. But they are showing, showing some signs of uh, going down. However, there's some other things that are going up. The farther you uh, have a project away from the river, the more concrete it is. Electrical panels are still expensive and far either a year away. So. It just depends on what materials. Uh, you can get doors a lot easier now, but the hinges are a problem. So it's just your six, six one half dozen the other on what you can find. But things are getting a little bit better. Uh, contractors aren't complaining as much as they have been. So. But there's no percentage to answer your question. We don't have a percentage as to how it's up or down. Okay. What day do you set, think this will go out for bid? Approximately. We think we will advertise for bid middle of October. Mm -hmm. If we get all the approvals and like we you know, at the maximum, middle of October. And, that's and they bid weeks back weeks. by November. Bids back. Right before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I thought you said. That'd be our goal. You don't want to do it over Thanksgiving because contractors won't participate. 
So if, it, 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 if we don't get things back in a timely manner, we still have a, a I feel we still have a, a week or so barrier built into that schedule to do so. Um, Richwood, Cherry River is at least a five week bid period just because of the complexity of the, the uh, phasing. Normally you do them in about four weeks. This is gonna be closer to the five weeks. Uh, if it has to push, then we'll probably end up pushing it closer to almost three weeks because you lose the week of Thanksgiving. You don't want to take bids right when you get back from that week. You need to give them several days to get them prices back together. So you lose a little bit of time, maybe okay. two and a half weeks. And it depends on how quickly we get SBA approval, correct? All that hinges on all that. Yes. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. You want to be careful? Sure. Thank you all. Okay. Next on the agenda, discussion. Discussion on the superintendent's goals as they relate to school performance, <coughs> student outcomes, and or academics with board goals and actions to improve student achievement and well-being. month I have to have something on that talks about the um, you know school performance student outcomes and academics and I had a principals meeting and I asked the principals how they would like for me to report um, their progress and um, so after a lot of discussion we have a new program that everyone seems to really you know, our principals say that the teachers seem to, to really like it, and it's called IXL. That program will actually provide us with data for um, student progress, whether they're meeting standards, whether they're falling behind, the percentage of standards being taught. We can break it down to the actual student. We can you look at it from classroom level. We can look at it from school level. Um, but it actually has all of the state standards listed in the program and then it actually creates groupings um, so that teachers know which areas that the students are not proficient in meeting the state standards so that they can work in small group instruction and things like that but if i uh, bring the ixl program that houses everything for us i can bring it up and i can show you <coughs> to date it is a live feed it'll show you to date how much um, has been accomplished and one of the great things about that, with everyone using IXL, we can, um, all the principals will know that each month, when I have my principals meetings, we'll discuss it because the board's going to see exactly what's occurring in the classrooms and, and the percentage of students that's proficient. So that's the approach that I, um, that I had planned to take <coughs> with the board. You know, I had I could have brought it up tonight and showed you, but I thought it would be better just to discuss it with you, see if you had any ideas or suggestions. Um, if you think that's acceptable, then I'll pre be prepared to start going that monthly with the board. Does the IXL cover uh, all subjects? It covers math, English, social studies, <coughs> science, Spanish. Mm -hmm. I think first level of Spanish, but English, math, social studies. Science, first level Spanish, I believe. I think also, uh, Dr. Tietri, uh, the reason we have to have this discussion every month is a result of State Board of Education policy requiring us to. Yes. Policy 2322 <clears throat> involving having more involvement of the school board in the actual academic progress and success of our schools. Um, so that's the impetus for it. But, uh, um, so there, this discussion will be, we can see materials without student names, but how yes. things are progressing. Yes. And, um, yes. And, and I can actually, you know, drill it down to, so that you can actually see teacher names, you know. Um, but I think it's important that the information be presented to this board so that you understand the performance levels. And, um, you know, it's um, accountability. It's support, um, you know, I'm really working and charging, you know, my principals with being the instructional leaders of the schools, and um, 
and it's also addresses part of my goals with this board. Well, goals have to be are required to be measurable, and uh, they have to have a time for completion. That's okay. a that has to, I mean, that's why you're doing it, because it has to be done. You have to, you have to have a measurable way to examine your goals, and you have to have a time stated for completion of the goal. And it, it'll be monthly, so that's why once a month I'll have it on the agenda, and then I'll be able to present the information by school, by county, by English, by math. I'll be able to present that to the board each month. I'm sure as we get into this, there'll be a lot more questions to come up uh, in regard to how this is being uh, worked out in the schools and how much analysis they're doing of the data and with their staff and that type of thing. And to, um, at, at, it as, has to be a perpetual thing. Yes, it just can't be a one-time year at, event. And as we <coughs> progress, it may be things that the board sees that you say, well, I would really like to have more information. I can adjust it. So I think that we start out with this, show you the information we have, how we how we analyze it, how it's being analyzed at the school. That's something we've talked about with the principals. But again, as we move through, absolutely. You may be th there may be things that you say, I, you really want me to take a look at and show additional information and we can do or we can adjust it. So whatever I show you, I'm not saying, oh, this is what it is, it has to be. I can show you what we have and we, we can evolve. We can do whatever we need to do because the goal is to improve achievement. Well, what I'd like to see is not <clears throat> so much um, that they're analyzing it, but that they're doing something with it, like to, you know, they're changing this or that, whatever needs to be changed in order to increase it. That's the beauty of this program. So students, when they, they it will actually group students because it will group students to areas where they are deficient so that the teacher automatically knows that the student has not mastered this particular standard. So they have the, stu the students group. So you can do small group instruction to help them become proficient. So instead of the teacher sitting down, I mean, you know as a teacher, you know, well, Johnny's not getting this, I, I get, you know, my reteach is not, I'm going to pull them together. Well, this is really something that helps. It helps the teacher um, manage, manage the classroom because if, if, Sally over here is, is mastering this. We're going to have to move Sally on to the next and keep going. Whereas the other one, we're going to continue. We're going to do some reteach. We're going to help. We're going to do whatever we need to do with this group. And I excel. I'm pretty impressed by it. Pretty impressed by it. And again, I think it's something that, um, you know, we can go in and do an, a, a more in depth presentation. One of the great things um, that I have, uh, of course, Sarah is just a wealth of information and support to me with the curriculum, um, especially on elementary ed. And then we have Josie Groves who handles secondary ed because that's her background. So she's going to be you know, providing a lot of support to secondary ed. So this covers K-12? Yes. Mm -hmm. And everybody's using the same thing. That's good. And it's a lot easier as an elementary teacher to know what your students because you only have a certain number, whereas middle school, high school, we might have multiple classes. So yeah, they're they're saying so this to me, a day. right? <laughs> to, to me, this would be more beneficial for yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Middle school, and high school. A lot of people don't understand that because you know in your typical elementary classroom, you know you're seeing about 25 kids a day, and it depends on if you've. If you're one of the unfortunate ones that have a, a flex grade, you might see, you know, 35 or 40 a day. But typically it's 25 a day, whereas we've got, you know, 100 and some running through, you know, our high school. So it's a lot to manage. And, uh, again, I, people seem to be pretty impressed with it. I'm impressed with it. Um, we did have some conversations about level set and continuing that. So um, I am leaving that up to each individual school. Um, I don't like to get too many programs going at once, so since we're adopting this one, leaving it up to the schools to make the determination of whether they want to continue that this year or not. But the IXL is what we're going to promote. And again, I think it'll give the data that we need. We did in the results that were shared with us by a couple of the elementary schools how much progress they've made with the kids. 
based on that eye. <coughs> it was impressive. Mm -hmm. Yes. Will, will this be compiled so we'll know, or will it be school by school by school? Well, well, I can drill it down to, I can drill it down to teacher. We can, we can drill it all the way down. So I can show you what I had hoped, and it depends on what you guys want to see. I had hoped we could show you the county, this is how we're doing as a whole in the county, and then we can break it down and say this is how we're doing for every ninth grade across the county, and you know, and then, and this is how we're doing for each individual school. So I mean, we can break it down to however, and it just depends on what type of results that you all want, but I think part of it is just showing you, um, I'm gonna provide what I think you want to see, but if there's other things that you want to see, that's one of the beauties of it. You know, I've got all these educators sitting here. So you guys know what types of things you want to see. Tell me, I'm sure it will generate it. If it doesn't, we'll figure out how to. Will the schools be able to look at this and yes. see where, will the classrooms be able to look at this? Yes. Okay. Yes, because it drills it down. That's how the classrooms are able to look at their individual students. And when a student's not mastering a skill set, then they know that they can, it will actually group the kids who didn't master this and the, group, and the group that did master it and it I mean it's a great organizational tool I was impressed if they'll only follow through with well I, I think we're going to have a better chance of follow through now than ever because I'm going to be showing this to the board every single month and you guys are going to see so you know if with you as a teacher knowing that the board's going to be looking at exactly what's happening what you probably would want to do it. So I think it's a great. I think it's a great thing. Uh, this, uh, Dr. Lee, would this serve in a form of uh, a, a benchmarking? Um, mm -hmm. This is ongoing progress monitoring. As in every week, the kids can go in and they call it jump into the arena. But basically, they would take a few questions off of what would be their benchmark beginning, middle, and end of the year, and then there is a specific snapshot window where any questions that the kids haven't come to, they will finish. So for example, at the beginning of the year, they take one in ELA and they take one in math, and it's about 45 minutes. But for the ones that follow up in the middle of the year and the end of the year, they will be significantly reduced as long as those kids are going in every week. They're kind of working on it as they go. Those ones they tell us will be about 15 to 20 minutes. So it's not labor intensive, but it provides that up-to-date snapshot of where they are. Then it makes a personalized plan based on the skills that they need additional practice with. That's what I liked. Because you're actually getting, you're, they're getting individualized plans. I would be interested to uh, see, because there's a gap in testing between 8th and is it 11th grade now? Yes. So how, how you know, what's happening in grades 9 and 10, I'm sure a lot of that, the data that's available uh, is being shared department-wise, I guess, between the, those other grades so that the, the helps can come from that area to get ready for the 11th grade testing cycle. Is that yeah, and then they have specific checkpoints for math for the high school based on what's being assessed and where those kids, it's almost like predictability, where they're likely to score on these particular concepts. But, but that is absolutely a, the expectation. And again, in the principal's meeting, that was, that was the discussion. So we're not only looking at the test scores for the classroom, but they need to be looking at grades below, grades they're sending them to, make sure we have those communications. And I've asked my principals to work on plans because middle school has a pretty big role in this you know they're they're being fed to and then they're feeding to the high school and we have to know where those students are deficient and work to to bridge that and make those alignments so those are some discussions we've had that's going to be part of our um, principals meetings um, and having those discussions and again the principals are the instructional leaders I don't go out and tell them what to do but they they're giving me feedback as to how they think that they can best accomplish it Okay, before we move on to action items, and this is not on the agenda, but I want to recognize Mrs. Rapp and Mr. Stump 
because when I went to the Nicholas County football game, well, when I went to the Nicholas County football game, Miss Rapp stayed after and was helping pick trash up, and I think that's very commendable. So I wanted to thank you for that. And uh, we know that's not part of your job, but we appreciate that. And also, Mr. Stump in Richwood wore his work clothes over there and picked up trash, um, weeded, cleaned the bathrooms. He helped out a bunch. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you. Okay, number four, action items. Discussion, uh, A, discussion and approval of Cherry River Campus construction documents with approval to put for bidding, pending approval by the West Virginia School Building Authority. Any discussion on that? Action item B, approval of the MOU with New River Health, Memphis County High School and Summersville Middle School. No, um, that we did uh, contact them about adding the um, the 30 day out, and they were amenable to that. And the contract was mailed to us, but we did not receive it. So she's going to personally drive over a copy tomorrow. So we'll need to table this um, for this time as well. Okay. Action item C, approval to place the following policies on 20-day comment, uh, athletic coaches, student assessment, vacancies, professional postings, and suspension. Student supervision welfare by professional staff, self-harm and eating disorders training, um, Megan's Law, weapons, professional leave for educators, Food service personnel, vacancy uh, service positions, suspension, student supervision and welfare by service personnel, self-harm and eating disorders uh, training, which is also part of Megan's Law, uh, weapons, staff evaluations, self-harm and eating disorders prevention and treatment, weapons, weapons, and Ms. Atkins. Yes, those were loaded into your board packet, so if you have any questions, I will entertain those. Have we done weapons before? Yeah, Neola, they they duplicate a lot of their policies and put them in different sections, and I'm not sure why they do that, but they have, you know, like they have a weapons policy, they have a weapons policy for professional personnel, they have one for service personnel, and they have one for employees, or for students, rather, so. Okay. And they're basically all the same. And they're, they're identical, and they should be. Right. <laughs> It said uh, it mentioned the length, but any, and then it said or any length of blade, I believe, down at the bottom. So, what section are you in? Well, it was the first uh, 3217, I believe. Do we allow certain size knives in school now? They're not allowed in, but it, it's not expellable. In any land? Where they're the, not allowed in, but they're not, it's not expellable. It's not, okay. It's not yeah. a, an issue like it was at one time. 
Well, previously, if you had, it was like a zero tolerance policy. If you had any knife at all, the statute said you had to expel them. Yeah. And so it's, you know, it's been relaxed a little bit because. Mm -hmm. Well, I can I can tell you there was there was an extreme approach to um, knives previously. Mm -hmm. And when I first came in, you may recall there was a student who was up for expulsion. I hadn't been here very long at all and brought an attorney. The attorney pointed out the fact, the intent behind the use of that knife. Mm -hmm. And the argument was absolutely correct. So it backed up, made rethought. I talked to different superintendents across the state and there was a, an opinion that any knife, if it was three inches or three and a half inches or whatever, that that was expellable. Well, that wasn't actually the correct interpretation of that. The same thing goes that if a student had marijuana in a container, it was explained to me, and I think Mrs. Rapp's here, she could probably verify <clears throat> if the student had their hand on that container and didn't touch it, didn't use it, but had it and passed it on to someone, it was automatically expellable. Mm -hmm. So the interpretations were much different. And when you get an attorney who comes in and points that out, it's pretty easy to see that, well, I'm not sure why it wasn't challenged before, but that's exactly what caused the thinking in that. And that was prior to, to Mrs. Atkins well, you know, coming there were some differences between a weapon and a utility. Yes. Yes. The knife. student, yes, because we had some students who carry pocket knives. If you don't see them, we don't know about them, then, of course, it's not an issue because we don't know about it. Yep. But if you have a student who's threatening to kill someone, even if it's a short blade, that's still expellable. But if you have someone that has a, a, a weapon that's used for, you know, it, there's, there's a definite difference. And we did get that sorted out and feel pretty good about it now. But, but that's what happened. It was an attorney that came in and challenged it, and he was right. Uh, intent. It was intent. Because we use them in instances where you use them, but it has to have a purpose for being there. Now, this one, for instance, is just a weapon, and it's over three and a half inches. So, no question, right? There is a question. Oh, there is a question on that? If they just carry it. If they just have that because, and they, and, and there's no threat, there's no threat, uh -huh. then that would definitely be disciplinary, but it doesn't mean they'd technically be out 365. It might be something that they, you know, it depends. I mean, there's a lot involved. How is it seen? How do we know about it? You know, is it a threat? Is it someone, or is it some kid who, like they said, has been in the forgot to take He's it out of the backpack. Yeah. So right. we try yeah. to use common sense. Right. And, and this. earlier they had gotten in trouble if they found them in their pack and they said, oh, I forgot to take it out and had it out hunting. Well, and, and that's when people were being sent home 365 days and, and only getting right. school two evenings a week. But if he had that at school and said, hey, I'm going to get you, oh, then that that's a whole be. different ballgame. Right. So then what we do at that point is we do a, an assessment of the student and the student is sent home they're not allowed back in school but then there's an actual assessment done a threat assessment to determine if that student is considered a threat was it a credible threat what's the circumstances involved the psychologist does an interview um, sometimes we even go with outside interviews and then if it's determined that the student is not a threat, then they may be permitted to go to the learning center. If the student is considered to be a threat, then they're not allowed in our school's period. Yeah. And utility knives, you know. McGuire, he came prepared. He, yeah, he, he was prepared for everything. So the, although this has knife blades in it, it has a lot of other things that you can use to fix. We them. should never see them. A teacher should never see those. If you're at the center, if you're in English class, we shouldn't see that. But yeah, if you're right. but if you're an electrical class out at the center, you know, they may be using their own tools. I was looking for the blade. I don't even see a blade. Now on this one, see that's they call it a common utility or sheetrock knife. 
certainly a very short blade, but it can be devastating. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it really depends on was there a threat? Was it something that was stuck in someone's pocket and they forgot about because they do drywall work in the evenings? Right. I mean, there or has to be in, some common sense. And, and um, I, you know, my concern is, is, um, is safety of the masses. And I'm going to always err on on safety of our kids. But if it's if it's a threat versus someone who forgot something in their pocket because they're a worker, you know that that's totally that's different. Mm -hmm. But at one time we did just about anything that cut. At Was one time, offense? this board prior to me took a very harsh stance yep. on everything. I had a little 380. I could have laid that in there, but I want to sleep in my own bed tonight. So <laughs> I didn't, but it could easily be slipped in, you know. And that, I, I think that's something we have to watch for. I don't know. We're not going to check every lunch they, box. They do random checks through the. They do random checks through the metal detector. Okay, and we still have those operating in the secondary. We do. In every school, we have them. Okay. Um, and one of the things that we have, and it started at Nicholas County High School, was the Stop It app. So it's an app that any student who knows of anything, because you're going to get more information, I think, by, from students who can anonymously get on a report. So that Stop It app does an alert, and you know that helps tremendously. Um, you know, and it would surprise you the stuff that's coming up on um, on on tablets. You know, Chris Hanshaw worked late Friday evening with a, a principal because, a, you know, a student had, you know, researched about not wanting to live. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, with social media and with the electronic devices, we do have ways of, of tracking and looking at different things and reporting. So thankfully, I think we are safer. I know we kind of got off track here, but with the knives, I mean, it, well, I just I'm, think I'm, you have I'm to have some common sense. Just, I did, that wasn't real clear. Yeah. And I knew what I knew what we had done in the past and yeah. how it was handled and I didn't think that kind of went along with that. But Dr. we change. We change. Dr. Penix, would you like to change uh, seats? <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. didn't know he was so uh, loaded, did you? He passed the candy bag around. <laughs> well you all handled it, I didn't. Uh, no, I, the only thing I carry is having a lot. Yeah, and what would have happened like stuff previously because you all touched it, if you'd been students, you all would have been out for 365 even though you didn't know it was wrong. See, <laughs> I used to carry a pocket knife all the time mm -hmm. and I quit doing it because of the very, yeah, and then, you know. Yeah, but you're never going to, you're not going to know unless you're doing something improper if you don't have it out. If you have it out. And well, you see it, then I was sitting at my desk at Lepsy one day and opened it up to open the letter up and wasn't thinking, and you know, yeah. that's but any other questions on these policies? Any other exhibits? No, not the money. Okay. No pepper spray. <laughs> yeah, I don't okay. Action item D, approval of the technical corrections to policy 4124.01, probationary contract. Yeah, that's also um, in your in your board packets. Uh, it just changed the uh, changed the date and uh, a couple of words. It's just very very minor. Actually, I think it. Corrected a spelling error. Um, okay, um, three two four two. Is that supposed to be professional learning for educators or professional leave? On the agenda it says professional lead on the well it's professional learning <clears throat> that's 
the name of the policy. Okay, so on the agenda, yeah. it's just typed wrong. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on D? Okay, action item E, renumber uh, the Nicholas County Board of Education Policy IKKAA-R to NEOLA Policy 5200-01. Uh, this is the policy on exemptions and it was one of those that we just missed pulling over um, when we were working on the revision. And it is also in your board packet. Okay, thank you. Does the uh, uh, sorry? Does the number of allowable absences include uh, doctor's excuses in the exemption policy? I'll refer to Miss Gregory on that one. There, there's a certain quantity of absences for class period, is that correct? And overall? I'm sorry. I, there, there is a, a certain quantity of absences for class period and overall absences if they're whether, absent. Whether I, doctors or not, any, any absence? Yes. Right. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Mm -hmm. Mitch, I'm not trying to rush you. You good? Anything else? Uh, no, sir. Okay, no, sir. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, no. um, all right. Um, action item F, approval all for the following electives on current events at Nicholas County High School. Topics, world history, 9th and 10th grade. Topics, U.S. history, 11th and 12th grade. So, so you have a copy of that in your mm -hmm. work packet. I asked Mrs. Rapp if she would, um, you know, come in, in the event that you had questions. One of the things, you know, with these electives, <coughs> that's something that's common for boards to create and approve, you know, electives at, at the uh, county level. This is not for dual credit. It's just simply for electives. One of the things that, of course, um, that I always have to pause about is, um, you know, elect on current events. So, you know, being neutral, being impartial in the delivery of current events, one of the things that always makes me a little bit nervous, you can say Fox News, some people will cringe. You can say CNN News, some people will cringe. So I think that, personally, I think that you would have to really be careful. I mean, the principal, in my opinion, depending on how this is rolled out, is going to have to make sure that this is a very impartial, unbiased delivery of current events. I think they're wanting to hear on what's going on maybe in the United States, but world, like, just like um, the death of the queen. You know, that's not really political, but they brought that in with current events last week. Yeah, now, we don't teach U.S. history or any we city. Do. We, we do just have wanted a, a couple of electives outside of your normal just all These are more current than his, historical, well, although there were some historical backgrounds, and of course, it's, it's the Constitution and, and... Right, they're still getting that in their regular classes. Yeah, Just a couple of, of electives so they could have something else to choose from. Kind of so, reinforce the values. So these, these would be for next year? This year. For this year, right now. Yeah, it's a local elective, a local approval, not it's not state approval. Yes, there in the we was. Right. That, the only thing. I mean, I'm not against any of us. Let's put it that way. Start with. But I would be watchful that they don't. We don't get this woke and CRT and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Into it. Um, I just. They won't do that. Okay. Well, I just you know I. Why, why are we looking at a syllabus of a class? I don't understand the purpose. We're not in that 
I mean, that's not our job. Yeah, it well, is. It is. It is. Well, then we have to look at every syllabus. For every no, this is just for time. electives. Yeah. This is just for, see, the board has a right to adopt local electives. So in the Weavis catalog, there's a list of, there's a list of courses, and we've done it in the past. This is not the first board to do it. Um, there's a list of Weavis numbers, and the state gives local boards of education to adopt local programs. And they do not, they're not, over, they're not, there's no oversight from the state, but counties, if there's something that you feel or our school system feels that it's important for a county to, to have in a class as elective, then the local board can say, yes, we vote to put that in, then that becomes an adopted local course. So we have other adopted local courses. Or if you say, well, I have concerns about this and I don't agree, then you vote against it and it just doesn't come in. So, uh, so if, this, if Dr. Or if <laughs> Dr. Rand <laughs> approves it, then uh, I'm satisfied. I mean, this is Rand. This is an expert. A little, you know, instead of just offering another class, we can make we could have made the class sizes a little bit smaller. But there's not the kids really don't have a whole lot of new electives. Right. So this kind of wanted to broaden that elective. This class is it, it's coming from the standards for social studies. I mean, yes, they pulled it. They pulled social it studies. Standards, standards. Social studies standards. So, are we currently doing this? Yeah, ninth and tenth are in the world and eleventh in the world in the U.S. So, like I'm one, backtracking a little bit. One class. Well, that's fine. So, it's not going to cause us to hire more staff. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. One class of each at world and one class. Yes. Of, uh -huh. I went through the master once that does so and before the new leaders kicked in to see and look at class numbers and I shifted some of those to make room to, to do something extra. And it's, this is all about encouraging critical thinking about the events that are occurring in society and the world today and not... I, yeah, we have, I mean, I really just don't think kids know a lot about what's going on. I agree. <laughs> They do in TikTok and all that other stuff. I, I, I agree with the superintendent. I think it needs to be presented in a very, um, you know, unbiased fashion. You know, just presenting facts and uh, you know about the events, and then let the kids uh, critically think about what they, what their opinions are, and that type of thing. Pat O'Neill's teacher in the U.S. and he's he travels pretty extensively with Africa this past summer, so he has a lot to bring to the. And he has friends in different places in the world. So well, yeah, to bring to I think culture is interesting to study cultures and, and uh, see how different people handle different situations. And, uh, yeah, the, the syllabus of both classes looks great, but I just didn't understand why it's just we need to put for a position to approve or censor or what. <coughs> it's just a county. It's a just county. to the county because. Uh, it's an elective. Yeah, and there's others. I mean, we have one, the, I guess, the, the a marine biology one that they were yeah, doing. That was, local. that was local. So we have various local ones that's approved um, that you probably don't even realize are local programs. But anything I didn't realize else, it was local. Yeah, anything that's outside of policy 2510 is local or we take it for a state approval. And there's, like I said, there's a, a large set of numbers that we can use that never has to go to the state. But this doesn't have to go back to the state. No, this, this is, is local yeah. only. Does not require state approval. And do we have to approve this every year? No. Okay. Okay, any other discussion? All right. Do we have a motion to accept action items A? <coughs> C, D, E, and F. Right. I make a motion. I have a motion by Mr. Berry. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. Dr. Penny seconds. Any discussion? Ms. Green, you still with us? I'm still here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. 
No discussion? Everyone in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Green, are you in favor? Yeah. Okay. Anybody opposed? Okay, motion to carry. All right. Moving along to consent items, num number 5A, finance, payment of current invoices. Yeah, I'm, I'm Kevin tonight, <laughs> so I will um, try to answer your questions the best I can if you have them. <clears throat> Those are in your, in your packet. Can the current invoice please this and we got to see it, right? Did you get that one? I didn't get that one. Is that the one that's the picture in the packet? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and did you see the note on that? Yes. From Sheridan. Okay. Just tell me to make sure you saw that. So did everybody see Miss Sheridan's note about check two two zero nine five nine six? Consent items A, number two, bids, uh, life touch with Cherry River Elementary, and forest scrubbers to be determined. I think I will, I will defer to Mr. Stump on that one with the uh, life touch with the Cherry River. It's my understanding that that was the only bid for that. Okay. <laughs> The floor scrubbers, um, we actually only have had a bid, a bid from one company, um, but they, they sent in two slightly different bids. Um, none of the companies, we had, we had a couple different companies inquire about the bid, um, but they couldn't do it right on the, on the specs because of uh, shipping time and availability of, of the types of scrubbers that we had put out to bid. Um, it ended up only one company put it out to bid, but they put out two different, very slightly different um, products um, that, that were basically, the scrubbers were just a little bit bigger, um, but actually, they actually give you a little bit more um, coverage when, they, when they're working on the floors, but um, the reason I said to be determined was because there was a, a little bit of a price difference. Um, because of the two different types. The one type was very basic, very generic. It had, uh, the floor scrubbers had a wet battery, so it required maintenance from the custodians to have to make sure they, they maintain the, the water levels in those batteries. Um, the batteries don't have quite as long of a life expectancy, um, and especially if they, don't, um, if they don't maintain that water level, we're, we're going to have to replace the batteries more often. Um, and the other one was a, uh, was a battery where they, where they don't have to do that, more what most batteries are going to in, in our vehicles and things like that. Um, the price difference was about a little over $9,500 total um, for, the, for the whole package. And we we're talking about 13, 13 floor scrubbers. Um, so each school, uh, each school gets gets a floor scrubber, um, and so that the total amount was uh, for the um, the one that doesn't require maintenance, um, one hundred thousand seven hundred twelve dollars and seventeen cents total, and for the uh, the one with the wet battery, uh, ninety one thousand one hundred fifty eight and forty seven. Um, for the, those those that was the difference. Um, and that, those are cordless. Uh, I, yes, cord and and they, I guess, plug them up and charge them at night. Self, yeah, self propelled. Yeah. Yes. 
So the ones they're using now are old, old. Yeah, I, I, I believe so. This was, this was one of those, um, <coughs> this was, I, I know this was uh, to come out of, I believe, the COVID relief funds. Um, and it was, it was one that um, I believe it came out before, before I had started. Um, oh, it had to do with that cleaning package. There was yes. other things in that. So I know this was, yeah, I know this was determined, it was determined, um, of course, I, I've, I've, I've seen it through uh, up to this point, but um, hadn't gone out until we're a little slow getting, getting out to bid, but we got it out to bid, and this, this is what they came back with. So how much, are they bigger than what we have now? Yeah, a little, I, I think that one of the problems we have now is, uh, from talking to people, is we have different products everywhere. We don't have the same product. Um, and so this would give us a universal product in every school. Um, if, if you all approve the bid and we purchase these, once we get them in, I'm going to plan a uh, professional development for all, all our custodians so that we're able to maintain and uh, uh, use these properly so that they, they will last a very long time. Um, but to answer your question, they're, they're a little bit bigger than I think what we have now. Um, and that was really just because of the availability. I think um, they cover, I think like, I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but the pads are two inches bigger and it has two pads on it. So it's about four inches bigger than what what we would have now. But it's still st still small enough to go in and out of doors and, and uh, you know, perform what it needs to do. And you want the one with the regular battery, not the one you have to fill up. Uh, yeah, I would like to. I, I, I mean, I think it would be. I think it would be wise to go with the. Uh, it's the AGM battery. Probably um, on the SDM, I imagine. Yeah, mm -hmm. just just because if if we don't, what I'm afraid would happen, and we have we have amazing custodians, but um, if somebody doesn't know how to take care of it, and they don't take care of it. Um, it, it could end up costing us a lot more down the road. Is that just for the scrubbers, or do you get so many pads to go along with that? I'm not sure about that. But at least you would be ordering one. We would. One every, pad. Everything would be the same. Yep. It would all. Everything would be universal. Um, and so the uh, the company the company also said that um, they, they'd be willing to come in and actually do. The professional development and uh, make sure everybody was trained on on how to use it, how to maintain it, and so everybody would get it all at once and everybody be on the same page. So that that would be my recommendation would be to go um, with is the AGM battery. What's the company making the video? It's Liberty Distributors. Um, <coughs> the actually out of Tridelphia. Any questions for Mr. Stone? While you're there, have you got any reports on the progress of, of the track at the Panther? Anything? Um, yeah, the, the, um, the asphalt is down. Um, it's pretty smooth. Um, it, it's it's not perfect um, by any any stretch of the imagination, um, but it is it is. I thought it looked like that when I drove by. Yeah. It is pretty flat. It is finished. Uh, we were able to get the walkway from the parking lot down to it. Um, you know that's uh, handicap accessible. Um, we still have have a little bit of work to do um, in order to make sure we we keep vehicles and certain things off of the track. Um, it, it's not designed to hold a whole lot of weight, so we definitely don't want any kind of ATVs or vehicles right. out on it. Um, but I think it will be—I think it will do uh, Panther Creek. Uh, I think it will be good for them um, to walk and run one. And then uh, now, now we just have to get get the work, the dirt work around it finished. And uh, I think it will—it it will look a lot better once we can get that done. And it. And it'll end up it'll end up being a nice thing for the school and community, I believe. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, consent items three, out-of-state travel. Uh, Tom Bl uh, Bayless, Tariq Blankenship, Samantha Helena. Jason Miller, traveling to ACTE Career Tech Vision, Las Vegas Convention Center. November 30th through December 4th. What are you doing there, Tom? What is that? It's uh, ACTE has it's the it's the biggest CTE conference of the year. Uh, there's about four or five thousand attendees there. About three hundred different workshops attend. Uh, so it's it's the big event for CTE of, of the year. What's that paid with? It's paid with our federal parking fund. Okay, and. That's something the public needs reminded of from time yeah. to time. That I know I hear it all the time. Well, why are they going on these trips? Some of that money is earmarked um, for, professional for professional development. And you know, as a teacher, I used to think, well, why are these people going here and why are they going there? Well, sometimes the money has to be sent, spent a certain way. So, um, you folks that are watching or reading. In the paper that money a lot of it has to be spent certain ways that's why and they don't just go on a trip to go on a trip so and I don't know it used to be if you didn't use that money the next year you wouldn't receive yeah, they'll, 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 they'll catch you back yeah. Yeah. okay so do I have a motion to accept? Is there any other discussion on any of these? I'm sorry. Do I have a motion to accept the finance payment of current invoices? So the moved. bids for life touch. Oh, That's all right. Um, and the high bid for the floor scrubbers and the out of state travel. You have it. Mr. Moose makes a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Barry seconds. Oh, maybe we're right there. That's fine. He's good. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So, Mr. Barry, was second. Mr. Barry. Well, I, I think Rick answered for what I did. Mr. Barry, you second it? I heard Mr. Barry. I'm going with Mr. Barry. There we go. He said nothing. Plus, he has some weapons over here. <laughs> no, um, so motion passed unanimously. Y'all got to lose like a little bit. Um, all right, personnel. Yes, um, I have passed out to you the updated personnel agenda. I was just trying to upload it into the board packet. Uh, for Mr. Green, but I'm having sync issues with my OneDrive and it, my September stuff is not there. So I have no way of uploading this to him, but I can, I can read the changes. <clears throat> uh, and, okay, and a copy was made available to the public. Uh, your changes are um, from, from where it's published on the agenda are in red and highlighted in yellow. Uh, so on the first page, uh, Ann Carpenter, employee in the position of special education teacher at Summersville Middle School, effective upon hire for replacement. She is currently at the Learning Center. Um, we are removing the social studies teacher, the flex teacher, and the itinerant Title I teacher. Um, those will be reposted tomorrow. Uh, Stephanie Flanagan, employee in the position of social studies teacher at Richwood High School, effective upon WBDE approval. Uh, Minnie Kaufman, imply, uh, employee in the position of halftime Title I teacher for Birch River Elementary, effective September 30th, 2022. Uh, on page two, uh, employed in the position of substitute teacher for Nicholas County Schools, effective upon WBD approval. We added the names of Theodore Olzak, Kristen Burwell, Melissa Carey, Eric Siebert, Jamie Bottaford. Uh, for restricted substitute teacher, also pending upon WBDE approval, we added Elizabeth Groves, David Coney, 
Arcuni, Holly Beckwith, and Amanda Hinkle. Um, under service, uh, Mary Queener, employee in the position of Transportation Instruction A4 at Richwood Middle School, effective September 23rd, 2022. Amy Roberts, employee in the position of Custodian 3 at Golly River Elementary School, effective September 1st, 2022. On page 3, Deanna Smith, employee in the position of Halftime Cook at Summersville Middle School, effective September 21st, 2022. Uh, we are removing the ECAT for Cherry River. Um, we didn't have anyone in the system apply for that, so as a result, the people that did apply will have to be given the aid competency test. Um, so that will be scheduled, and I should have a recommendation for you uh, the next board meeting. Uh, Scott Queener, employing a position of bus operator for bus 125, effective September 20th, 2022. Um, and You'll, I took off here about Roy Moore being employed in the after school bus operator position. That's actually a service extracurricular position and it's already listed on the agenda. So that was just duplicative there. And uh, we removed the after school bus uh, operator for Birch River Elementary. Um, we currently have not had anyone been on the um, after school positions at Birch River. So hopefully we can get that lined out and then we may have a recommendation for that as well. Um, we also removed uh, from the agenda the after school site coordinator for Birch River and after school site tutors for Birch River. We did not have any applicants, did not have any ac ap um, applicants for the um, interventionist at Summersville Elementary um, or Cherry River Elementary there on page four. Um, under service extracurricular, uh, Robin Wilson employed in the position of after school cook at Golly River Elementary School, effective at the direction of the building principal. And again, that was the, the bus was duplicative there. Employed in the position of substitute emergency custodian for Nicholas County Schools, effective at the direction of the maintenance director, Amy Roberts, William Roberts, Matthew Roberts, David Bell, and Larry Connor. And just to kind of explain how that works, um, lots of times we put we put things out over the calling system if we have a vacancy for custodians and no one picks it up and then you have you know they have no custodian so we came up with this substitute emergency custodian so if it goes through the calling system twice and no no substitute picks up the position if we have one of these emergency substitute custodians who's available then they can go work part of a shift probably can't work all of the shift, but at least then you get some custodial coverage um, for those schools there. Under consent, Anita Jarrett resigns her position as after school tutor at Gully River Elementary School, effective September 19th, uh, 2022. Also permission for the superintendent to post and hire after school positions until October 3rd, 2022. The after school program actually started today. And you notice we have multiple um, resignations on here um, that I can post tomorrow and then hopefully we can get people um, working in those positions um, before too long if you approve of that. On page five, we added several names to the volunteer list. Uh, Alita Neal, Kayla Jones, Megan Kisner, Tammy Mullins, Alyssa Klein, Amy McCarthy, Andrew, Andrew Woods, Brittany Metz, Felicia Chapman, Gina Scarborough, Joyce Carr, Kathy Bucks, Christy Arthur, Lori Nutter, Marianne Fitzwater, Natalia Johnson, Rachel McMillian, Sam Stewart, Stephanie Amick, Tammy Bales, Taylor Critchley, Tiffany Tennell, Tracy Radcliffe, Callie Sims, Christina Davis, Katie McLaughlin, Sabrina Woodward, Bridget Pettit, Deborah Thomas, Derek Thomas, Julia Morris, Karen Davis, Katrina Groves, Lauren Johns, Mary Caulfield, Reba Rader, Rashanda Ritchie, Shaylin Freeman, and Stephanie O'Dell. On page six, you have two leave requests from employees that I will not read aloud to protect their privacy. Um, and then on page seven, you have um, the vacancy list. Um, <clears throat> so with the hires that are pending, it says hire pending, that's people who are on the agenda tonight. If it creates a vacancy over in that far column, I'll list what it is. 
and if I'm reposting, I have two posted now, and I will be reposting some others tomorrow. Uh, so if you approve the agenda as presented tonight, uh, we're going to have 14 vacancies of classroom teachers, um, and we will still have three other vacancies. Um, we'll have to have two counselor positions and the um, TIS if we decide to refill that. So Anita quit her uh, after school duty and took a job at uh, Zeal. Zeal, correct. Yeah. Correct. What about that teaching position of Panther that we talked about last time? Okay, that is actually on here. We did a, a voluntary transfer from within the building. Samantha Russell is moving from the special ed position into that. So that's actually under consent there for you to approve. And then we will post the special ed position tomorrow. Um, you are probably going to shoot me. Uh -huh. but, um, I think we have a, I need to go into executive session and discuss first thing. Okay. So, Mr. President, I move that we go to executive session for the purpose of discussing first thing the state Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Do I have a motion to come out of the executive session? So moved. Second. Mr. Berry made the motion, seconded by Dr. Pennings. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. At 8.09. Okay. Can you hear it? Yes. I'm on there now. We had a motion by Mr. Pennings to come out of exec executive session, a second by Mr. Berry. Vice President. No, it's Vice President. Sorry. Mr. Berry made the motion, Dr. Penny second, and we all agreed to you as well. Mr. Green? Yes. Okay, thank you. Can all you right. hear me? Yes. Motion carried. All right. Do we have a motion? And uh, let me say there were no decisions made during the executive session. Do we have a motion to accept the personnel agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Motion made by Dr. Panic, second by Mr. Moose. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, I think Aye. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. A little slow. <laughs> motion carries you unanimously. Um, all right, number seven, superintendent's information. Construction planning, architectural update, and I think that's... I think they covered it. I'm not speaking for you, but... Yeah, we're good. Okay, number eight, reports, Dr. Penix. I have to confess that this month I just did not make the meeting, and I will be there the next month. Okay, thank you. Uh, reports, Bright Horizons, Mr. Green. I have none. Okay. Thank you. Are there any delegations? No, sir. Thank you. Items for future agendas? Uh, Mr. Superintendent, I mean, Mr. President, uh, <clears throat> Madam Superintendent, hmm. um, we had talked earlier about doing the training on uh, Zoom, how to access all that data that's on Zoom and to uh, get us familiar with that and then i'm assuming the state has now released and they're everything's in, at beyond embargo now it's not embargo anymore. so maybe we could have that data update on uh, performance <coughs> and then look at a zoom training at some time you know as a work session i mean do it in the morning probably would take off long but i think the board needs to know where you can locate data and the kinds of data that you can locate on the state website. There's all kinds of data there, so that's all. That's all. Yeah. So are you wanting a work session on that? I think it would be a work, what do you think? I think it would have to be a work session. Okay. It would have to be on a test. 
Yeah. The data, state data that's right. in Barbara and down the rules. So. And then, of course, that involves Dr. Lee, correct? Yes, she would be. Yes. And probably and, and, uh, Chris. Yeah, Chris and Joseph. So, should we set a meeting or should we? Uh, we'd have to make sure they're available. Uh, yeah, we'd have to make sure you look at their schedule. And it's a training session. I, I, you know, I've uh, referred to law. Well, I don't know that we have to have a meeting to have a training session because we go to W School Boards Association meetings all the time for training, and we don't have meetings at those. So. Okay, so we'll let the superintendent. Uh, pick a day somewhere the 10th through the 14th. Does that work for everybody or Mr. Moose, do you have yeah. what? Okay. October? Yeah. Um, let me, let me, that would um, be in between our meetings. I can't do the 11th, that's all. Just the 11th is the only day I cannot do that. Five, three, <laughs> so, um, I would be available any time that week or can be. Mr. Barry, are you okay with that week except? Yeah, 10 through 16. 10 through the 14th. 14. Can I get back with you on the date? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, as far as I know. But the 11th. So we know the 11th. Right, yeah. 11th won't work, but I think Dr. Penny's. Oh, wait. Looks good to me. Okay, so 10, 10, 12, 13, or 14. Right. And you can just. And and are they ever going to train us, like they say, on the evaluation of the superintendent? They keep saying they're going to give us training, but how long? Uh, that the state board you're saying, or the, not the state board, but the yeah, school board yeah, association. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, they said there are new regulations that we have to go by, and they're supposed to train us. And, uh. the, okay, uh, the we heard about that at the at the at your training the other day, and uh, my main concern was that lengthy document, the other one where we had to go through in eighty-two items, and you, you know that's not required. Uh, and we just simply have to follow the, the goals that were set by the superintendent. And um, their training, uh, that, any mention of it was um, very vague. Yeah, that, so. I, I, I was there. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I listened to it, but I didn't hear anything. It was very vague. Um, this is, uh, the superintendent, Mrs. Atkins, were there, weren't you all? Yes, the, yes. Oh, and did you hear anything differently or just no uh, no it's let's follow that chart because we adopted the policy and there's like that little chart thing and they said that's all you had to do yep yep yes. this board has adopted that policy so we've moved away from mm -hmm. that 80 some question yeah, it was just like it's five or six questions wasn't it hmm? is this five or six it's on the goal it's so just the goal four goals yeah, yeah it's <clears throat> a very basic one pager yeah. it's a lot easier to manage but uh, in answer to your question, Roy, uh, that was supposed to come out of the State Department, not out of the School Boards Association. Oh, okay. We've been pushing. We've okay. been pushing in that direction. But I knew you'd know, though. That's why. Uh, well, and they came and did the presentation, and, and well, you heard it. It was just very briefly covered. Um, yeah. And then, did you hear the Friday night session? The, the Friday night session? Yeah, I was at all of them. It, it got a little... A little touchy there. The <laughs> well, is that the one that Howard disagreed with the panel? We didn't disagree with the panel. We disagreed with the presenter, and uh, I just sat back quietly and listened. Uh, well, I was yeah, I wasn't sure there. exactly. <clears throat> there was a question arise, and Howard said, "Well, what's your opinion?" Or no, no, she said Howard. She, she asked Howard what his opinion was. And, uh, yeah. What what, what the, the question was? Uh, was she had said that we all that all the state 275 state board members had input in the development of the policy in the development of the evaluation form she said that and she said and she said well, mr. super that's what I said and, and uh, he said and no he, she said that he said uh, 
the, 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 and then she kind of backed up a little bit. He said, no, that's what you said. And then he asked all of us, he said, have you all had a part in developing the policy or the form? And nobody raised their hand, you know, so just kind of a little, you know, like that. But um, the, what we came out with was we have adopted the state's plan. We did that a year or so ago, and we didn't have to do the 82 items. But we thought we had to follow it until we were told not to follow and so um, we do not have to do those 82 items now. We just simply do the four goals. That was basically it. So I don't know anything else I want to tell you, but. Okay, does anybody, the uh, items for future agenda, I would like, uh, I would like Mr. Stump to update us on the Cherry River Playground. And I spoke with him about that. So we put that on the agenda. One sec. Any other items for future agendas? And you can always submit those to myself or Dr. Penix. Or Dr. Dr. Tiedrich. Okay, item number 11, future meeting dates, regular meeting Monday, October 3rd, 2022 at the Nicholas County Board uh, BOE office. Start time, 6 o'clock, regular meeting Monday, October 17th, 2022 at Nicholas County Board of Education office, start time, 6. And then there's one thing I'd like to announce before we close. And so the CTE program um, is doing a school, school service uh, personnel lunch, and that's hosted by the ProStart program. And that's on September 23rd, 11 to 1 at the Career Center. Is this Friday? Yes. This Friday. And, of course, they invited us as well. And I'd like to know if CMM has any progress to report as part of the next agenda. Okay. So they, so they do that every Monday when we have our, when our meetings. Yeah, on Muzzy on the call in, they do update us on on the and of course Dr. Penix on that call. I'm usually on that call, Dr. Uh, T Tree. Well, then you all relay that to us, right? We no. we can, right. and that, that's usually what that's she fine. relays. Yeah, that's usually what she relays uh, mm -hmm. later. Okay. And we did talk to them about coming every meeting, and it was going to be. Three thousand, three thousand nine hundred and some dollars every time they came. Even if they zoom, um, they have to prepare it more. Didn't, it didn't. I'm telling you, it didn't matter. Okay. It was three thousand ninety and three thousand sixty per person. So I don't think. Um, well, uh, we're giving them no anyway. Money. I was going to talk to you about that, but all right. Well, how much were they going to charge for the redesign? Uh, Did you hear me? We've, we've been paying on that all along, every month, right? Yeah. The redesign comes out of the Dickens County. Right. Right, comes out of our county money. Yeah. Okay. Kevin would be able to tell us that next time, wouldn't he? Well, it's not completely out. I mean, it's anticipated to be as much as 200000 so We've been paying them all along. Yeah, we've been right. paying all We have a bill this number so, so much each time. Out, so much so. every month. Mm -hmm. If That's what that goes for in the last few months to ZMM. Of course, some of it could be also the Glade Creek. Uh, no, it wouldn't be, would it? Well, it would be if they had to. Uh, they have to do. It's not, yeah, nearly as much because the, the other one went out for bid, and that's why. So anytime you have to do a redesign, then that's on us. FEMA only pays once. Right. Okay. Do we have an uh, a motion to adjourn? So move. Dr. Penix made a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. Hi, Mr. Green. Mr. Green, second. All in favor? 
Bye. Bye. Bye.